now we've reached the planning stage and from here on we're going to be dealing specifically with NetApp in our installation. It's important that we do the planning properly because it will make sure that the actual installation goes as smooth as possible and will minimise the possibility of mistakes during the installation. Now we're going to be running two SANs in an active-active configuration as we showed earlier and this will give us the ability to show how to set up high availability and how to fail over etc. So we'll need a set of IP addresses for each SAN. The first IP address we'll need will be for the IP management interface. And this is what we'll use to connect to through PuTTY and to Telnet onto the, uh, the SAN to do all the configuration. This clearly has to be on the same subnet as our main uh, PC. We'll be setting up the console, um, or I like to call it the lights out. This is the same as iDRAC or ILO um, in HP and, and uh, Dell terms. This can be very useful because it allows us to reboot, shut down, um, and remotely configure the SAN even when the management console is not available. So it's quite useful for going on and connecting to to watch the SAN booting up. Because we'll be setting our, uh, our SAN up to best practices, we'll be using multi-pathing, so each SAN will require at least two paths, so it'll need two IP addresses. We note that the iSCSI uh, IP addresses are on a different subnet, and we'll talk about that as we go through the, uh, the installation. We'll also need uh, two paths to our host, so we're only going to have one host in this demonstration. So we'll be, as you can see, this the same for both SAN1 and SAN2. Um, so this will, but will have diverse routes as well, so that's why we can see we have two IP addresses. Now, when we have finished setting up our SAN, we're going to connect this to a VMware host. It would form part of a large ESXi estate. Um, we need to give some consideration to how we plan our logical lungs um, and how they relate to data stores. As I said before, um, I would always run a one-to-one -one ratio between the data store and the lung. Now, there's a number of considerations we need to take into account when designing our uh, data store and lung ratio. The first thing to take into account is how many VM guests will be accessing per data store and ultimately per lung. In the past, there was always an issue around uh, iSCSI reservations, uh, and this kind of restricted the amount of uh, guests that could connect to the data store. Now, with modern um, iterations of VMware and storage uh, vendors, they've removed this requirement to have iSCSI locks or reservations on the individual lung. This has allowed there to be considering more VMs per data store. However, there is a number of white papers, um, and I'll put some links in the comments to these white papers, that still recommend reducing the amount of, uh, or not having a, a, a huge number of VMs per lung, um, and to break them out in a logical way. We spoke earlier on about how dedupe works, and there's some areas that dedupe really well, and there's some areas that don't. For instance, as I showed earlier, when you uh, got Windows 2008 R2 servers, all on the same data store, this would dedupe very well because there'd be lots of the same files. If, for instance, though, you had your swap file or uh, maybe an exchange log, it's not necessarily going to dedupe in quite the same way. So I would design my data stores so that the ones where I'm going to get the best dedupe from, I can put those uh, data stores or VMDKs, and that way it will give me the option whether I turn dedupe on on a data store or not. DGP is switched on um, per volume uh, and generally we would do a one-to-one -one ratio between volume and lung as well. So ultimately we can turn DGP on onto an individual data store. Now both snap mirror and snapshots happen at the uh, flex volume as well and as we have a one-to-one -one ratio to the flex, flex volume and lung up to the data store if there's going to be some VMDKs that you do not want snap mirrored for some reason, such as archive data, um, stuff that you might have a large change rate and is not necessarily important to mirror to another SAN, you want to make sure you put that in a data store that is not going to have snap mirror associated, associated with it and ultimately the flex volume where the snap mirror is, is configured. And likewise snapshots, for instance, I don't particularly like snapshotting exchange servers, so I would make sure that my database and, data, uh, and log files are in a data store 
that will relate to a flex volume that does not have snapshots turned on. Performance monitoring. We're going to want to monitor the performance of our uh, NetApp, and this can ha this will happen at multiple different levels. We'll look at, at the guest level, at the host level, the data store level, the lung level, and the aggregate level. And breaking VMware uh, VM guests into the different data stores, it makes it easier to monitor the performance at the different lung levels, so we can get an idea of where there's a problem. So if we are putting, say, our database. Um, data files on one particular lung. This will help us because we would expect um, high IOPS and, and low latency and then if we have a lung where we put all our file data for file servers then this will help us to, to performance monitor that because we would expect less IOPS and slightly higher latency. And it just makes breaking out easier because if we put it all in one great big lung, it's going to make it very difficult to try and differentiate between the different loads and whether they are um, working satisfactory. And then finally, just the logical management of it. There's a, there's a sweet spot in making sure that you don't have so many data stores that it's impossible to manage. Um, likewise, if you just put every guest into one data store, it might actually make it more difficult to manage in the long run. So we need to find a sweet spot. There, this is my setup. Um, this is not following any other recommendation. It's just purely how I found working in an environment with say three ESXi hosts and 40 odd VM guests uh, with a mixed load between domain controllers, exchange servers, SQL servers, file servers, print servers, etc. So I split everything out between the two stands, obviously, and I create the five data stores per SAN. I create one data store to put all my OSs in and split them 50-50 between the two uh, SANs. I then have data one, which is generally a very large data store. Um, and this will be for my file servers. This will allow me to put dedupe and snapshotting on I can snapshot more often because people are more likely to overwrite individual Word files uh, than there is to be the need to roll back a whole SQL server in 20 minutes or half hour intervals. These will generally dedupe very well as well. Then my data two, I normally put my program files. So when I'm actually installing Exchange or installing SQL Server, I won't install them on the C drive. That's not best practice. I'll install them on a different drive, typically a D or E drive. And that D or E drive will be stored, VMDK, will be stored on the data two. And when I talk about VMDK, I'm talking about a virtual hard disk. So the guest itself may have four or five hard disks, and those hard disks will be split between different lungs. Then data three, high transactions. So this is my data and log files for my exchange and SQLs. And typically what I'll do is I'll split load. So I will put the log on one SAN, and I'll put the data file on the other SAN, uh, because obviously um, when you're writing, data to a database, it writes to the log and then it writes to the data file. So you're putting double load on it. So be able to split this out between two SANs. And typically I'll alternate them. So I'll put my first SQL server data on SAN 1 and log on SAN 2. And then I'll put my data for the next SQL server, exchange server, on uh, SAN 2 and logs on SAN 1. And this is because because we've got diverse loads, this generally allows uh, for that flexibility within workloads. And then finally, my swap files, I will split them out between SAN1 and SAN2, and I'll put them in a data store because I've got no interest in replicating, duplicating, snapshotting, deduping, any of these because they're just so fluid. And ultimately, we don't really care if we lose this in the disaster recovery solution. So as I explained before, this is what a typical layout would look for, uh, say, an exchange guest. So I would put my OS on the uh, SAN1 OS. I would put my program files on SAN1 data one. I would put my exchange database on SAN1 data three. And I would, there's a typo down there, I would put my um, logs on SAN2 data three. Right, now we've got to plan the uh, physical setup of our um, NetApp. And 
In our instance, we are going to have a, at least, or we're going to have a second shelf with our NetApp. Now, if you're setting this up in a similar environment where you're talking about 40 guests, um, you're gonna need another shelf, if not for um, space, certainly to meet the IOP requirements um, needed for. So when you get your NetApp, it will show you on the back how to configure. Because we spoke about earlier about diverse routes between um, the NetApp and the switch, and the switch and the host, etc. When we've got a shelf that's connected to a NetApp, again, we need diverse routes. And just looking at this quickly, this is how you would connect it up. Um, the blue lines in indicate the um, SATA uh, cables. Um, and as you can see, this controller can talk to that controller. This controller can talk to that controller. That controller can talk to there, and that controller can talk to there. Now that is if, if there's a failure on any of these controllers, then it's to make sure that the either the um, master unit or the head unit here can talk to the other controller, which will resume responsibility. And likewise, if we have a failure here, this will take responsibility for handling this, and we need to make sure both of these can talk to that. If you have three shelves, then uh, refer to the NetApp documentation and it will show you how to configure this to make sure that there is uh, definitely enough diverse routes to at least handle one controller failure. In addition to the SATA cables, which is where the, um, the data will actually flow, we also have the um, control ports, which are these Ethernet cables. Uh, and this is for managing um, and monitoring the, the paths um, and they need to be configured in such a way as you can see here. So we need to physically get our, uh, our net up wrapped and we need to physically get these cables connected before we um, even start to power it up. Once we've connected all those cables, we need to physically um, connect the SANs to our two switches. Now, um, in the examples I'm going forward, I'm gonna be using HP Pro Curves and we're using 10 gigabit connections. So as we saw in previous slides, we need to have diverse routes. So you'll need to connect um, your port EF and your EG, so EF and EG. So 10 gigabit on switch one, 10 gigabit on switch two, and likewise from here, 10 gigabit and 10 gigabit. You'll also need to connect your management port to your management network. Um, this port will actually assume the IP address for both the console and the management. When we initially set up, we are going to need to use a serial um, cable, and the serial cable will connect into this port here. And finally, moving on, you're gonna to need to connect your um, ESXi host to the iSCSI switches so that we can configure a um, complete connection from end to end. <clears throat> now, you need to know what ports you're connecting to because later on we'll be configuring VLANs, etc., on these switches. But ultimately, you will want to have um, two connections to each switch. While our SANs are connected over 10 gigabit, our um, ESXi host will be disconnected over standard gigabit. Uh, and we're doing this deliberately to actually show how we can um, link paths together to um, handle higher bandwidth. Uh, this is a photograph of the back of the NetApp, as I showed you earlier. As you can see here, we've got the eSATA uh, SATA connections. We've got our management connection port here, and we've got our serial console port here, which will be connected to the laptop. And now we're gonna move on into our first practical video on how to configure all of this. I'm James Sillett, and I'd like to thank you for taking the time to watch this video. If you have any comments or questions, you can contact me by any of the means shown below.